Welcome, and thank you all for being here. My name is Gloria Palmer. I'm the Executive Director of Green Mountain Academy for Lifelong Learning. It is so nice to see all of you here in person and to offer this program here at Burn Burton Academy. I need to give a, a huge shout out to BBA and the techn technical assistance we have here. They recognize the value of education, obviously, but also community and a shared desire to provide enriching programs to their students and we adults. Special thanks to Jim Raposa, Francie Carrieri, and Kieran, who's in the uh, tech uh, booth up there. I've worked most closely with them in, in trying to bring this program to you. GNAT TV is also here with us videotaping this event. They are a community resor media resource with wide-ranging programs on local cable TV. They provide a wonderful service to us at GMAL, helping us to share our programs with a wider audience. Thank you, GNAT. Our first debate was held in 2016, five years ago, and it has become a popular offering each year since, with the exception of 2020, both educating and entertaining us. We have been lucky enough to gather these three gentlemen each time, and I just want to express my thanks to them, to you. The debate is moderated again by Steve Sinding, who has become an important part of GMAL, presenting lectures and facilitating the weekly roundtable discussion groups. His impressive resume includes work in international development, population sciences, and public health. Steve will do the honor of introducing our two debaters and explain the ground rules. Thank you, Steve, and enjoy the program. And please silence your cell phones. Cell phones. Off. Gloria, thank you very much. And thank you to, to you and Liz and the hard work of the GMO staff in keeping everything going through this awful past year. GMO actually has shined, I think, during this year with uh, the programs uh, on Zoom, and you've done a wonderful job keeping us in touch with one another and keeping the intellectual life of the Northshire uh, alive. So thank you very much for that. And thank you all for coming. Uh, as Gloria said, this is the fourth. Uh, two years ago, uh, Derek and Peter had tied in the first two debates, and it was the, uh, so that was the rubber event, and um, I won't tell you who won. Um, Actually, nobody won because it is you, the audience, who determine each time uh, the, uh, the favored position. Um, the, uh, the, 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 the rules uh, are as they have always been. Um, by the way, it was almost exactly two years ago that we last met at Long, uh, Long Trail School uh, I think we're 10 days further along in the calendar than we were uh, the last time we met, but it's almost to the day, uh, two years since we had the last one of these. Um, and the rules haven't changed. Uh, as befits a debate between two Brits, we're going to use the Oxford Union rules, uh, and they are as follows. Uh, each debater um, will speak for 20 minutes, uh, Derek in the affirmative, and uh, in this case, Peter uh, at the opposite side of that. And uh, we'll then have 10 minutes each uh, of repost, um, having listened to the arguments of the other to come back uh, with, uh, with, with closing comments. And then we open it up to you, the audience, uh, for participation. And I want to emphasize that Audience participation in this case is not question and answer. It is opinion and point of view. Uh, we really want to hear what you think uh, about the debate topic and uh, which of the arguments you feel is more compelling. Uh, and uh, so we're not entertaining questions, we're actually entertaining commentary from the audience. At the end of which, uh, we will have the debate, uh, the, the, the vote. But I want to emphasize again uh, that our purpose 
is to enlighten uh, and to entertain. Our purpose is to stimulate the discussion um, rather than uh, to uh, uh, pick a winner or, or a loser. Uh, if this goes well, we're all winners, and uh, that's as it should be. So let me introduce our distinguished debaters. Peter Radford is uh, one of Dorset's leading economists. <laughs> I think the other one may actually be in the audience, and so I, I, don't, I don't want to uh, make any invidious comparisons. You paid him well. <laughs> he is a graduate of, the, uh, of that hot butt bed of liberalism, the London School of Economics, and the less liberal, decidedly less liberal, Harvard Business School. Um, he was a banker for many years, and he is now and is the, the, the co-founder of the World Economic Review, which he continues to edit and publish. Uh, he is, among other things, uh, the producer of the Radford Free Press. Um, he is Gmail's president, uh, and uh, has uh, often uh, been a moderator of the roundtables. Uh, Derek Boothby uh, is a retired officer of the Royal Navy and of the United Nations, where he served uh, in security and arms control for many years, uh, including important assignments in hotspots around the world. He is a frequent GMAL lecturer, I think familiar to practically every one of you in the room, uh, on a very broad range, an impressively broad range uh, of subjects that interest Derek and have inevitably interested all of us. And he is a frequent contributor, I think this is still the case, to the Manchester Journal. From time to time. From time to time. So those are uh, the adversaries. Those are the rules. Let the conflict begin. <laughs> Now, the motion before the meeting is that the West has lost it. Yes, the West has lost it. First, what do I mean by the West? I mean, of course, the United States and its European and other allies. Lost what, then, you will ask? We tell ourselves, and probably my interlocutor will repeat, that the United States is still the strongest economy in the world, and together with its Western allies, amongst the six of the ten largest economies, seven with Japan, that the West has the world's best universities, the best health care, the best living standards, the best research organizations, and still leads in technology and science. The United States and its allies still have the best trained military forces and the best weapons. The economy seems to be recovering well, and the stock market is going gangbusters. So what is it, then, that the West has lost? Well, I shall argue that the West has lost its way in dealing with the rest of the world. Not only has it lost its position of global political dominance and leadership, it has not successfully come to terms with the fact that the world is changing fast. The West no longer commands the respect that it had as recently as 20 years ago. It's sitting complacently on the achievements of the 20th century, not recognising that what worked then will not work in the 21st century. So both in foreign policy and domestic policy, the countries of the West have lost their way. The West needs not only a strategy, but an action plan to deal with the world of the 21st century. Now, I'm not far, I'm not, I'm far, I'm far from alone in this view. In February 2020, the leading voices of the Western world met at the annual Munich Security Conference to consider a 102-page report entitled Westlessness. The annual M Munich Security Conference is the political security brother of the Dallas Economic Gathering. Chancellor Merkel and Vice President Pence had attended the 2019 conference, and this is an extract from uh, the 2020 report. Quote, Listening to Merkel and Pence, the audience came away with the distinct impression that there was no common understanding 
of what the West represents. Far-reaching power shifts in the world and rapid technolo technological change contribute to a sense of anxiety and restlessness. The world is becoming less Western. But more importantly, the West itself may become less Western too. This is what we call Westlessness. That was in that report there. Now, here is a quote from the Munich Security Conference of 2021, which took place just in June, just last month, no, six weeks ago. That's the, the, this report. Quote, unfortunately, developments have vindicated last year's dire analysis. Not only did Western countries continue to exhibit a lack of joint action on crucial global issues, the past year also saw continued attacks on liberal democratic norms in key Western countries, with the storming of the US Capitol as the most emblematic symbol of the threat to democracy. And I'm sure that some of you watched the dramatic testimony given by members of the Capitol Police at the Congressional Committee on July 27th. How on earth can we in the West proclaim our values in light of what happened in DC on January the 6th? But I'm not arguing that because we've lost it means that the West cannot recover. On the contrary, I am going to argue for action. That which hath been lost may yet be recovered. The participants of the meetings in June of the G7 in England and NATO in Brussels certainly seemed at long last to have recognised that actions are needed. With concerted effort, not just selfish nationalism, but much may be recovered. But in a phrase that we've all become used to, the new normal won't be like the old normal. A little bit, a bit of history. Western leadership in the global sense is little more than 200 years old. Benefiting from the timing of the Enlightenment and the Industrial Revolution, European countries looked overseas and established colonies in Africa, Asia, and the Americas. In the early 1900s, Pax Britannica of the 19th century was replaced by the United States and Pax Americana in the 20th century. But the sun is now setting on Pax Americana. Looking further back, 200 years of Western economic superiority and leadership have actually been an exception to the norm. According to a McKinsey chart, for the previous 1800 years, the world's largest economies were China and the states of India. And during what is known as the Islamic Golden Age from the 8th to the 14th century, there was a period of cultural, economic and scientific progress that far exceeded what was happening in Europe at the time. Europe was generally regarded at the time by Islamic experts as a backward wasteland. So by 1990, the West had been at the forefront of world history for perhaps just under 200 years. Between 1948 and 1973, productivity rose by 96.3% and real wages by 91.3%. Jobs were plentiful as the West rebuilt itself after paying the costs of World War II in blood and treasure. But by the early 2000s, globalisation had appeared on the scene and jobs went abroad. By 2015, productivity had risen by 73.4%, while wages for blue-collar workers had risen by only 11.1%. On average, in 1965, an American CEO was paid 20 times what a worker was paid. And yet by 2018, according to the Economic Policy Institute, on average that number was 271 times. And some believe that it is now even higher. Until the beginning of the 21st century, much of global growth came from the G7 countries. The United States, Germany, Japan, UK, France, Italy and Canada. And when those seven countries established the G7 in 1975, Together, they contributed about 70% of world GDP. The West was the locomotive of world growth, and the developing world hitched its wagon to the train. But since then, the situation has changed. The world's economy has grown, and G7 countries now represent close to only 40% of global GDP. And while many Western societies have been stumbling in the first decades of the 21st century, 
with gaps between the haves and the have-nots growing, and domestic social and political strains increasing, much of the rest of the world has advanced. Not everywhere, but in many places. Human security, which is generally recognised as freedom from want and freedom from fear, has improved significantly. In 1950, almost three quarters of people in the world were living in extreme poverty. By 1981, it was down to 40, 44%. By 2016, research indicated that that figure had dropped further, down to 10%. And Johan Norberg of the Right Wing Cato Institute has been right, reported as saying, quote, if someone in 1990 had told you that over the next 25 years, world hunger would decline by 40%, child mortality would halve, and extreme poverty would fall by three quarters, you would have told them that they were a naive fool but that fools were right, because that is truly what has happened." Unquote. And much of that progress, let's face it, was by the benefit of Western leadership. So for that, we can pat ourselves on the back. Now, are there still some people living in extreme poverty or in extreme fear as a result of conflict or persecution? Yes, certainly there are, such as the Uyghurs in China and the Rohingya in Myanmar. And we certainly should not airbrush them out of our sight. But in general, the global picture has changed, and it is continuing to change out of all recognition with the past. <coughs> but in the meantime, however, what has been happening in the West in the past 10 years? By 2019, unemployment was at its lowest level for years, but tell that to the miners, coal miners in West Virginia, or the steel workers in Pittsburgh, or the redundant factory workers in Detroit. In 1980, there were 24.9 jobs per $1 million of manufacturing output. By 2015, that had dropped to 6.4 jobs per $1 million. And if industry is making more with fewer people, then there are only three ways to achieve this. Either things are being made somewhere else, or they're being made by robots, or both. Capitalism has always depended upon creative destruction, but it has been the speed, literally the speed, of globalization and technological change that has been the new factor. The United States, with about 4% of the world's population, has almost 25% of the world's prison and jail population. Yes, almost 25%. When they come out, most of them won't be able to get a job or a place to live because they won't be able to pick the right box on the application form. And so they fall prey to drugs or have to depend on food stamps. In 2007, 33 million participants received $30 billion in SNAP food benefits. <coughs> According to the website of the US Department of Agriculture, Food and Nutrition Service, in March of this year, over 42 million Americans were receiving SNAP benefits. 42 million on food stamps. And this is the richest country in the world? What is happening abroad? Europeans have been feckless and discombobulated, with Hungary and Poland becoming more autocratic and the British choosing to leave the EU altogether. But the global political centre of gravity is no longer Europe, it is Asia. And in, in Asia, the West is being played by China. In 2014, the number of robots for 10,000 Chinese manufacturing workers was just 36, compared with 478 in the Republic of Korea, 314 in Japan, and the world average of 66. These statistics are according to the International Federation of Robotics, and you can find them yourself on the internet. In 2018, China installed about 154,000 robotic units and is the world's largest industrial robot market with a 36% share of total installations. By comparison, in the same year, 2018, the United States installed 40,300. At present, the top three countries with the highest robot density per 10,000 workers are Singapore, South Korea and Japan. The United States is ninth. The first country to, de to deploy 5G technology on a large scale for digital cellular networks was South Korea in April 2019. 
And the largest telecommunications equipment manufacturer in the world is, of course, China's Huawei. The pace of change is truly remarkable. And also learning from Western experience, there have been political changes. Again, not everywhere, but in places that matter. For millennia, Asian societies were feudal. In recent years, we've seen them accept democratic norms, but not in the sense of the liberal democracy that we have in the West. Whereas in the past, feudal leaders have demanded that the people be accountable to them, the modern leaders, such as Narendra Modi in India and Xi Jinping in China, have recognized that they are accountable to the people. But in China, accountability is not as we understand it in the West. It is a two-way street, and the Chinese Communist Party autocratically rules the roost. Xi Jinping has described his system as socialism with Chinese characteristics. In India, China, Indonesia and Sri Lanka, they have looked at Western democracy and decided that it's not the model for them. But they do share a common conviction that sound governance in ways that are appropriate for their respective cultures will transform and uplift their societies. And in turn, African and Latin American countries are looking at Asian examples. Kenya has a program called Vision 2030. Costa Rica is following, not Western, but Singapore's best practice. And my point is that they no longer seek to follow the West's example. These and similar changes elsewhere in the non-Western world carry with them major psychological changes in self-confidence. No longer do they see the West as the natural source of global leadership and advancement. China has openly rejected our liberal rules-based order. And at the same time as China has changed domestically, it has been looking outwards with vision and energy. China's Belt and Road Initiative is a massive and worldwide program of construction, development and trade. It is far larger than the Marshall Plan that followed at the end of the Second World War. And its extent and significance are well recognised in relevant circles of the government in Washington, D.C., but I will put it to you that the vast majority of Americans pay no attention to what is going on. As I said earlier, China, or more accurately, again, the Chinese Communist Party, is playing the West, and it's not playing by Western rules. Corporations in the West have been falling over themselves to comply with China's restrictions in order to have access to the Chinese market. But to do business in China, China requires multinational companies to have a Chinese partner and to share their Western technology. And we consumers have only been too happy to troop into Apple and Walmart and Best Buy and Costco and others to buy goods made in China because they're cheaper than goods manufactured here in the West. And in an, in an attempt to level the playing field, tariffs have been leveled against China. But who then pays the higher costs? We, the consumers, of course. Western Airlines used to have routes to Taipei, Taiwan. But when China threatened to curtail Western Airlines' travel routes to Shanghai and Beijing, unless the destination Taiwan was dropped, the airlines all complied. Now the routes are listed as just to Taipei City. Australia made critical comments about Wuhan and the pandemic, whereupon China cancelled imports of Australian coal, wine and iron ore. And as I say, China does not play by Western rules. In the meantime, just as the people in the non-Western world are cautiously gaining trust in government, Western populations have been losing trust in government. The Edelman Trust Barometer, again, on the internet, reported that in 2020, 82% of Chinese have trust in government, 79% in India, 70% in Indonesia. Among Western countries, however, the countries were 59% for Germany, 45% for UK, 42% for the United States. Now, we can have our doubts about the reliability of those figures, particularly of China and India, but no one can deny the wide difference between them and the Western countries. In a Pew Research Centre survey conducted in 2019, five world leaders were tested for trust to do the right thing in world affairs. Not a single Western leader achieved over 50%. Angela Merkel received 46%. Donald Trump received 29%. President Trump is, for the time being at least, behind us. 
In June, President Biden went to Europe to meet with the G7, with NATO allies and with President Putin. And in an op-ed in the Washington Post before his departure, he declared that, quote, this trip is about realizing America's renewed commitment to our allies and partners and demonstrating the capacity of democracies to both meet the challenges and deter the threats of the new age, unquote. And yet, at the very same time as the United States and the West are actively pushing their own vaccination programs towards 70% and higher, and even offering lottery prizes of over a million dollars, Africa has not yet achieved 2%. And the West's active support of the World Health Organization's international program for sharing vaccine doses, called COVAX, is little more than crumbs from the table. Derek, two minutes. And just recently, we have had Richard Branson and Jeff Bezos taking tourist rides in lower space. Well, of course, <clears throat> charity begins at home, but this appearance of Western self-indulgence has added yet more damage to Western reputation. Now, when Soviet communism collapsed around 1990, Francis Fukuyama wrote his essay entitled The End of History. It ended with a question mark. It wasn't a statement. It was a question. And in that essay, he speculated that the era might be, as he said, the end point of mankind's ideological evolution and the universalization of Western liberal democracy as the final form of human government, unquote. His basic assumption was that what was good for the West must be good for everybody else. Western triumph was accompanied by Western arrogance. As I've already said, just because the West has lost its way doesn't mean it's gone forever. In June, at his news conference after the G7 meeting in England, President Biden said this, we're in a contest, not with China per se, but a contest with autocrats, autocratic governments around the world as to whether or not democracies can compete with them in the rapidly changing 21st century. Exactly. The outcome of the G7 meeting was at last a strong sign that the challenges have been recognized and cooperative action is needed. Now, whatever views we may have, I think we can all agree that the world is a messy place. There are no clear and ambiguous answers. Neither is there any need for a hand-wringing Western apology. The West has made, and continues to make, major contributions to the advancement of the human condition. But we, in Western society, need, at large, need to sit up and take notice of the changes that are taking place. The West needs to up its game. Known the era of 20th century Western supremacy and Western dominance is past. No longer can we afford to sit back and smugly assume that we are right and everyone else is wrong. It is the 20th century, 21st century, and we need to fight for our values. The West needs to develop a new, more equitable relationship with the rest of the world, and it needs to stand up to China. As shown at the G7 and NATO meetings, there are now, seven, now signs that the current Western leaders and elites recognize this and do it together. But there are only signs, there are only signs, as matters stand at present, and as far as the motion before this meeting is concerned, yes, the West has lost its way. But a vote in favour of this motion is not an acceptance of defeat. On the contrary, I put it to you, it's a recognition of the need for action. I ask that you vote in favour of the motion. Thank you. slight correction to my uh, explanation of the rules. Uh, after Peter, we will then turn to the audience for your commentary. And at the end of that, the speakers will summarize their positions, uh, largely on the basis of uh, what each other has said and what they hear from you. Uh, and then we'll have the vote. So, Peter, over to you. Thank you. I'm <coughs> glad Derek agrees with me. <laughs> You'll notice the soft shoe shuffle. The motion is the West has lost it, not that it's about to get it back. And it's in the past tense. The motion fails on its own merit because he's already said we're going to get back in the game. The game's not over. And if the game's not over, the West has not lost it, past tense. I could rest my case right there. It's quite simple. Uh, <clears throat> 
Have we lost all of those fabled Western values and freedoms? No, of course we haven't. Have we lost our freedom of religion? No. Speech? No. Press? No. Association? No. Have we lost any of the important things that define the West? No. Not at all. Not at all. Uh, have elections? All right. I get that they get a little messy now and again, but we have still voting, some of us. Right? We have political expression, perhaps too much. All Western values, I might add, these are not Eastern values at all. And the Chinese would agree that the struggle goes on. In a recent strategic document published by the, the Communist Party, they said that they refer, to the, uh, they refer to the United States as a key ideological barrier to their own success. <clears throat> the West clearly has lost it in China's mind. Look at it from their point of view. They posit a world in which the struggle continues. And that's the point. The West has not lost it if the struggle continues. It's not over. No past tense. No. The West has not lost it. This is an interesting scorecard that uh, uh, Derek, Derek has given us. All of those lists of statistics, all of these handy reports. The, point, the, the big missing part there, scorecards do not tell the true story. They speak to quantity, not quality. They reflect population size. Derek made a good point, and I'll get back to it myself in a minute. But they don't reflect per capita prosperity, which I would argue is by far the more important measure. Besides, it can't be in the past tense. I'm going to, uh, if I find it, yes, here's a, here's a little quote from Chuck Schumer, somebody I'm not a big fan of, but nevertheless, here's a quote. Around the globe, authoritarian governments smell blood in the water. They've been listening to Derek. <clears throat> they believe that squabbling democrat democracies like ours can't come together and invest in national priorities the way a top-down, centralized, and authoritarian government can. They, they are rooting for us to fail so they can grab the mantle of economic leadership and, and innovations. What was he saying that in the context of? A $250 billion uh, government program to boost investment in artificial intelligence, chip manufacturing, and all the kinds of industries that Derek is uh, uh, saying that the Chinese have just grabbed top dog in. In other words, the United States Senate, a moribund institution in my opinion, is fighting back. The West hasn't lost it at all. No, no, no. All right, so past tense. Well, come the motion fails on its own merits. So let's, let's attack it in a couple of other ways. Immigration doesn't sound like it's relevant. You've all heard of immigration issues. You've all seen pictures of people in boats trying to get into Italy and Spain. You've seen them getting in boats, maybe crossing the English Channel to, to England from France. You've definitely heard about the whole army coming up from Central America, climbing over the whatever how much of the wall there is in getting into the United States. These people are risking life and limb, literally. And where are they going? The West. They're not going to China. Do you hear stories of people climbing over the Great Wall of China to get in? No. Do you hear, see pictures of boatloads of people trying to get in? These people are risking life and limb to get into the West. Now, either they're incredibly dumb or well, they know something that we ought to remember. And that is that Western values, however we have trashed them through the years, and however we take them for granted, however complacent we get, are incredibly attractive to people all over the globe. And this argument is not about uh, economic size, although I'll get to that in a moment. It's about those values. Let me, so let's strike one. Definitely strike one. I'm going to remind you about the migrants frequently. Let's talk about modernity. Derek raised this. Oh, the great contribution that the West made. It's all in the past tense. That's not at all true. Western commerce, Western capital, Western aspirations. You can go on the list. Western, Western leadership, in those terms, the West invented modernity. The China is trying to get to the modern world. It's trying to get to the world that the West invented because it knows it's a good place to be. Good for them. I encourage them to try. 
What are all those Western values? Freedom, tolerance, individuality, innovation, prosperity, inclusion, argument, and exploration. This has been a long three, two, three century effort in the blurb that uh, Derek wrote. He said the Treaty of Westphalia in 1848 was a kicking off point. I, I tend to agree with that. They take time to develop these values. They take time to embed. They, have, they, they are, a, are, are a result of enormous struggle, conflict. Europe is really good at struggle and conflict, if you are familiar with the history. Those ideas have emerged, they've been battle-tested, and they survive, and they attract migrants. What on earth have we lost? We have those values still. The key also is that the West is outward-looking, not inward-looking. It's a trading culture, and it, is, it rejects autarky, autarky being self -su economic self-sufficiency for this purpose. It, we value the exchange of ideas versus intellectual isolation. We are explorative and experimental versus bureaucratic and administrative, which is the Chinese tradition through millennia. China has a long and profound commitment to an inward view. In crisis, their instinct is to retreat within their own vastness. It provides all they need. It always has. They retreat whenever they're pushed. The West has a profound commitment to movement and exploration. It is open and innovative. It has to be, because it can't be autarkic. It needs supply, it needs trade. It drives the West outward, and that creates an inventive, outward-looking, and open mentality. That's what is attracting those migrants. The West hasn't lost it at all. Those ideas endure. Let's strike two. I'm, I'm really bad. I'm gonna, I've got six strikes here, guys. So you know, we're, we're going to reinvent baseball. Derek mentioned the fact, and I'm glad he did, that people obsess over China. Well, actually, Derek was obsessing over China becoming the largest world economy. And then he mentioned, crucially, that it always was. Yes, China was the largest world economy through to about the end of the 1800s when the United States took over. Think about that. When Great Britain went through the Industrial Revolution, changed the modern world, and when France and Germany followed suit uh, during the mid-1800s, even though they were growing much more rapidly, and even though they were industrializing, they were never bigger economies than China was. And were we quivering in our boots about the Chinese take over the world in 1850? No. Size of their economy doesn't matter. The size does not matter. I want to get your attention away from that. Living standards matter, and the Communist Party of China is terrified over providing those living standards to its population. China currently ranks 82nd in the world in per capita income, 82nd, just behind Costa Rica, you mentioned Costa Rica too, I think, and above Russia. For the United States, just for purposes of reference, ranks 13th. There's a whole bunch of little countries right above it, Bahamas and tax havens of various, which distort their numbers. Uh, the United States just ranks slightly below Norway and slightly above them. But we shouldn't get distracted by the glitz of the new the industrializing Chinese economy. They've minted 1,000 billion billionaires, 500 in the last five years. Their economy is undoubtedly growing really well. But two-thirds of the population still lives in rural destitution. They're not necessarily in agriculture, but they're in rural destitution. They are a third world country, which is why, which is what annoyed Donald Trump when they applied to the World Trade Organization to get the benefits of being a third world country. They are. They are a third world country. If you look at their development pace, which has taken off just in the last couple of decades, and if you project out to 2050, if you do one of those fancy curves that economists love to do, by about 2050, they will have added about 60, between 60 and 75% more wealth. They will still, on a per capita basis, be one third, one third of the United States. The West has not lost it, really has not lost it. The, and the enormous risk that the Communist Party has to take 
to get that large population to that modest level of well, some prosperity, which would incidentally get them to about the level Portugal is today, not not in Portugal, but it's not a world power, right? To get the Chinese population, 1.4 billion of them, up to Portugal's level, they're going to have to take enormous, enormous economic risks, especially if they're trying to do it in that short a time. Especially if they're trying to do it in that short a time. Their current growth rate is unsustainable. Everybody understands that growth goes in these curves. It flattens out. And the irony of all of this is the United States parenthetically hit that. Flattening out, Derek gave us some good numbers about stagnation and wages. The, the United States flattened out in the mid-1990s. The Chinese are already on that road. It's staggering to think, but they are already on that inflection point. They will need to boost themselves heavily to get beyond that. That involves enormous effort to increase productivity, and they are currently about one-fourth as efficient in turning their effort into wealth. They are not going to make that turn, not easily. The risk is too high. Diminishing returns. They, they, they're also, their industrial policy also runs the risk of running them into the Soviet trap. They, they could end up with an awful lot of iron and steel and no one to buy it. So let me repeat a little bit. The Communist Party lives in fear, I mean, not so much of the West necessarily, they fear us ideologically, but existentially they fear their own population. They promise to get that level of prosperity and the risk, they're putting all their chips on one, one point on the board. The risk is that they won't make it. So success, all of this talk about the West losing it, or has lost it, I should say, is nonsense. They're the ones playing the risky game, not us. They then claim, Derek mentioned, to have found this new way forward. It's, you know, authority and capitalist socialism with the Chinese face or whatever they want to call it. It's not new. Singapore was the first people, really the first people you mentioned that too, Derek. Go down that road. But the problem they all have is that there's only one way to make the route to the top and then sustain it, and that's the Western way. It's a con you when you introduce free enterprise the way Dane did to get that economic growth, you open the door to those other values that the Chinese fear. Freedom, tolerance, and so forth. These are not ideas that they're well known for. And we're already seeing pushback from the Communist Party as it understands that the high-tech industry that they rely on to get their productivity up is connected with the West and is driven by uh, uh, data-driven. <clears throat> they are clamping down. I don't know if you've been watching the, the press recently. They've been clamping down on, uh, on their companies that have uh, gone public in the United States. They're refusing the United States... Uh, auditors to look at the books because they fear what they're going to find in those books and they're, and they're clamping down within China. They've gone after some of their top names, Tencent, Alibaba, Didi and so on. And it was just in this morning's Financial Times, there I poured a lot. Just in this morning, almost $90 billion of net worth from those billionaires has been wiped out because the Communist Party clamped down. What's that going to do to future innovation? It's going to slow it down. They are risking that growth rate. <clears throat> Derek mentioned uh, the uh, Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, the use of muscle, economic muscle, to establish international in influence. Uh, there, the BRI is, is heavily debt influenced. There is a lot of concern currently about the American, uh, the, the, the Chinese banking system. They have got levels of debt 250 percent of GDP. Their banking system is creaking. In fact, there is concern in, in a lot of Western, bank, Western banks that the crisis, there could be a credit crisis that rumbles out of China and it affects the rest of the world. But the point about that is, what's the novelty of the Belt and Road Initiative? Derek himself said that the, the West exported itself and dominated and traded and created colonies and all that. It's the same thing. Every country goes and does it. Why should the West suddenly run away and hide just because of BRI? We've got, already got the top, top spot. Coca-Cola, 
We just the, the West tends to do it through private enterprise rather than public enterprise. That's the big difference between the two. <clears throat> the West hasn't lost it at all. All this hand wringing. I don't think the Chinese can pull off their leap forward. We should not assume they, are, they can. In fact, we should stress test them a little bit. Let's move on. That's strike three, I think. I lost count. The West, and going back to the values, the West is adaptable. The West is not monolithic. Quick question, is the West, for instance, capitalist or is it socialist? It invented both of them, and it's both. And through time, it has actually gravitated kind of to the center. The United States is a bit of an outlier. But social democracy has become the working model for the Western world, and it does work. I just said Norway has got a higher per capita income than the, than the United States. Sweden, Finland, the other Nordic countries do very, very well, and they score very, very high on satisfaction ratings. The West has not lost it, because those countries, last I looked, were in the West, and they're doing very well. The West has variety, and variety and diversity are its strong points. <clears throat> the, the Chinese repress, they, re, they, they, they hold back progress. The, the, it fears adaptation, it fears openness. Repression will stifle progress and slow economic growth. That's another risk they're taking. The, there's a tension in China between the desire of the Communist Party to, to survive and its desire to provide prosperity to the Chinese people. Those two will inevitably come into conflict. Len Leninism is self-defeating because it provides only one path and tolerates no diversity. It proclaims to understand history. Uh, they can only be one tra trajectory. It cannot adapt. Remember the Soviets. They went down this path. In... <coughs> The West has not lost it. The struggle continues. Derek said so himself. The West has not lost it. Let's strike four. I know, I know we're we're now into non-baseball world. But we got about a minute to okay. strike left. Okay. <laughs> touche, touche. Well, history lesson. Let me end with a quick history lesson. Remember those migrants, but history lesson. Beware the predictions of Western failure. The Great Depression? Oh! The Soviet Union is not going down the tubes. We are. Capitalism's over. No, not so much. How about, oh, a few years later we had the atom bomb. Oh, now we've definitely lost it. Because they you know, these people are unreliable Soviets and so on. No, that didn't happen. Sputnik, they beat us in technology to get up there. We've lost, we've lost, we've lost. No, didn't happen. Uh, how about the oil crisis? Oh, the West is suddenly dependent on oil. What happened after that? The Soviet Union collapsed, not, not, not the West. The Ch Japanese miracle, they've outproduced us, outthought us, outmanaged us. No, not necessarily. Even the Great Recession, which was a disaster, a self inflicted wound, we came back. Each time the West has emerged stronger. Why would we think this is different? It's not different. Just ask those migrants. So let me just, if I may, summarize. Don't be fooled by doomsayers. <laughs> okay? China is big but not infallible. Its risks, the risks it's, it's taking are huge. China's, Chinese history is that it turns inward. Not, it doesn't face outward easily, comfortably. At some point they will retreat. It's not about the size of the economy, it's not about the size of the military, or any such thing. It's about values, and they are Western values. Freedom, toleration, innovation, inclusion, which lead to prosperity. Those are battle-hardened ideas. They have defeated our authoritarians, and they will again. The West leads in all of those attributes. It still does. The West has not lost it. I ask you to vote against the motion. themselves once again. I think they deserve a round of applause. I have to say that um, every year, of course, I enjoy this immensely. I think uh, this could have been the best presentation of uh, the conflicting points of view that we've heard 
it, and that's a very, very uh, big statement because they have done so well in, in years past. But this really was invigorating, I thought, and, and very well, very well. Done. So we have come to the point where we want to hear from you. Were you persuaded by Derek? Were you persuaded by Peter? Did you come away saying, well, Derek really got that right, and then all of a sudden Peter says, well, wait a minute, I'm not so sure Derek did get that right. And where are you? Uh, let's hear from you. Let's see some hands and some commentary. Um, I think Gloria and Liz have microphones, which they'll bring to you. Talking about the value systems of the West, and it's... Hold the mic close to your... And it's collapsing situation. I mean, my experience, for example, in Africa or in China, shows different perspectives. For example, the closing or collapsing of the colonial system in Africa. And you talked about the migrations running for the modernism and the potential of European economies. Well, they are running from the collapse of those economies in Africa. They are being the victims of a colonial regime that didn't help them. So it's sort of, well, they took advantage of us, we'll go and move over there. But it isn't that they're really going after the value system. The other thing about China, which is fascinating, is, you know, I worked in China for a long, long time. You all know about Elvis Presley. Now, at one point in my life, an official in Yangtze province calls me and says, well, we want to thank you for what you've done for this country. And would you mind coming to a place that it's a small town, but there is a tremendous interest in the outer world, and you will meet Elvis Presley. Uh -huh. In meeting Elvis Presley in China, that's really an interesting proposition. So I got to this town, took me 20 hours by train, I was hosted in a very nice central location in a sort of municipal building, and the next day I was supposed to address the town, probably 20, 30,000 people, and a stage in the center. On the stage was a young fellow with a guitar. And the head of the community said, look, you are the first non-Chinese, the first European or white, I don't know what exactly the word was used in Chinese, but they'd never seen somebody like me. So I felt that I was a curious kind of person or whatever I mean, being that was being shown to the people. I tried to do as best as I could. Can, can you come to the end of this? <laughs> yes. But the fact is that, you know, when you look at the outwardness of Chinese to celebrate, and oh, they explain why Elvis Presley, the guy who was next to me with the guitar, was trying to sing like Elvis Presley, and I was supposed to evaluate that. But it showed also the look towards the outside world in a community that had been totally closed. That shows something about the Chinese spirit, which doesn't come out for me from the discussion. <laughs> Thank you. I, th I was just thinking to myself, if I had to find somebody to evaluate an Elvis Presley performer, <laughs> you would not be the first person who came to mind. <laughs> Thank you very much. Who's next? Um, Elliot. Elliot, Just, I, I want to give full disclosure. When Derek told me at my dinner table uh, with others that he, this was the debate topic, and he sort of indicated that he was going to wind up on the positive or the motion side, I really said, oh, I think I might have said, you're crazy. Uh, Derek had an impossible task, I think, I would argue precisely because I think of Peter's throwaway line. Don't believe 
in that pessimist. Not to believe in pessimism, I would submit, is a Western value. And that is why, in the end, this motion ought to be defeated, because of what Peter said are our values, uh, which will allow us to triumph and over history why those values have triumphed over a long period of time. Thank you, Elliot. Liz, do you have someone back there? I do. I don't know if this microphone's going to... Yes. Um, the microphone does not seem to be working, but can everyone hear me? Yes. yes. All right. I, I'll... Okay. Okay. All right. Um, I think it was remarkable that uh, both Mr. Boothby and Peter did a wonderful job in explicating the Chinese threat. And... I think that it's, it's remarkable how closely they appear to agree that the threat is real. Peter doesn't see, seem to think that it will eventually triumph, but it's real and it's one of the great problems facing the world today. I think that one fundamental difference between them that I don't know was made explicit is that Peter seems to reflect the underlying vitality of much of the Western world and the Western idea as it exists in the larger populations, and as he mentions immigrants, the average person. What Derek's position, I think, shows much more clearly, and to me is frankly frightening, is the fundamental loss of nerve on the part of the Western elites. And this is a huge problem, and if we do not succeed, it will not be because we do not have the underlying vitality, it will be because our <coughs> leadership has lost its nerve. And you can talk about this historically, the way the French lost their nerve after the First World War and the British after the Second. Uh, it, it's been a huge problem in the West, really for almost 100 years, where our elites have lost faith in the values of the West in a way that you don't see in the broader population. So how would you counsel people to vote? I would probably vote against the motion, but if I'm talking just about the leadership in the West, Derek's right. Okay, thank you very much. Who's next? Down here, in the black shirt with the right mask. Here. Yeah. Hi. Uh, I'd like to believe Peter, but I think one of the things that he has not addressed is the fact that uh, people within the West are losing faith, uh, faith of the Western values. And when you have uh, in the United States, especially one of the two political parties that's nearly um, that is embracing a lot of the authoritarian values uh, that we despise and say that we're at war with, uh, I think that they, uh, you know, they're not at war with authoritarianism. They're actually looking to adopt those values and not addressing that um, is, is one of the reasons why it's a race to the bottom if we're saying, yes, we're winning and we're going to win. We're not going to win the prize. The prize is not what we're going to want. Uh, there's also the fact that these countries uh, outside of the West that are, are following the Western values, they're trying to stri strive at what we are, uh, and, and they want to become that. That's great, but uh, the fact that you know climate change has really... <laughs> Put a, a, an end date on you know what we can expect as a, a, a good place to be, and our quality of life is not going to be so great. So uh, I, I think the West has lost it. The uh, Eastern countries are winning at our game, but it's a race to the bottom unless uh, we innovate ourselves out of this. But with a political party that is near a death cult and not really looking for uh, the, those values that, that sustained us through the last hundred years, um, it's going to be very, very tough. 
Very interesting point. Over here. So we've heard one idea that the West has lost it. But we also seem to be hearing that the Chinese or the East is losing or will be losing it as well. Uh, the question is, are they going to bring, help bring each other down uh, rather than anything else? And the, or, you know, to exaggerate massive hordes crossing the Arctic Ocean to get to the, some more else. But the idea, the question is, in the future, when China starts to level off, uh, which we have apparently already done, is it going to possibly bring both sides down that will lose the world that's lost it? Another interesting perspective and question. I have someone right here. Good. Okay. All right. I would, I would argue that it is too soon to the topic that, to me, we are historically speaking about where the world was in the, in the 1930s. I think we're looking at a clash between two gigantic philosophies. And the question is, will it lead to World War III, and will that be a cyber war? Uh, and I think the winner of that conflict will determine the answer to the, the, the topic. I would vote at the present for Mr. Boothby, because I think he is, he is closer to identifying the issues. OK. Down here. I think it's been very interesting listening to your comments on China, but uh, <clears throat> in my mind, I think this is a battle between autocracy and democracy. And my fear is that I'm not quite sure democracy as we see it played out um, now is capable of winning that battle. Um, I think if you look at the economic side, I don't think China's doing any more than Britain did with its mercantilism and tariffs. It was only when it got into free trade that it started to lose the battle against America, um, who uh, uh, pushed mercantilism and tariffs and protectionism uh, in order to overtake uh, Britain. And as America got into free trade, it's losing the same battle against China that's uh, really adopted the same kind of policies that both Britain and the US uh, adopted in order to win their war. So I think it's a, a battle between autocracy and democracy, and I'm not convinced that democracy as we see it is capable of winning that battle today. Well, we heard that argument very strongly in the 1930s. That turned out to be wrong. Uh, so uh, you, you uh, you also talk about the battle between free trade and mercantilism and uh, are arguing that the Chinese with their mercantilist approach are somehow doing better. Um, I, it it seems, seems to me two propositions uh, about which we can debate further if there are more hands to be seen. Here. Okay. <clears throat> I may have my figures wrong, but I would say regarding the economy and therefore regarding economic pressure that can be applied internationally, the West probably has lost it. My impression is that the Chinese, and let's not forget the Tiger, the Indians also, um, depend less on production from the West and on capital from the West than the other way around. If that's so, uh, I think we've lost it in terms of the uh, economics and the power that the economic economies can project. Good. Well, Peter, I think we'll have a response to that. Um, who else? I think I do. I see a hand back. Is that a hand? No. Wait. Yes. Okay. okay. The playing field with regard to the relative to both economies, talking about China as well as uh, the U.S., 
is not level. And we we discussed this many times. And uh, when you look at China, they're, they're still building coal, uh, electrical plants. Uh, their focus uh, on uh, their, their rivers, uh, there, there's, there's little really uh, that, that we can compete with at this point. Uh, and I think that uh, this has got to change uh, before we can compete uh, effectively. And uh, as long as China is, is really treating their, their as uh, Peter pointed out, uh, the, the standard of living is significantly different. And uh, I think that uh, once we, we address that, uh, and climate change is a very significant part of this whole thing. China is not come to, to grips with that as yet. So, Phil, who, who are you going to vote for? I'm inclined to uh, give a qualified vote to Derek. Qualified so, votes don't count. <laughs> <laughs> being, being an optimist. <clears throat> okay. I, I would go with uh, our, our economy, which is extraordinarily strong at this point. Okay. Thank and you. For Derek is, uh, are you seeing other hands, Gloria? Are we? Uh, I am not. Because we really are just about at the time to ask the two debaters to summarize their positions. We could take one more question if there is one. No? Okay. Sorry? No? Okay, well, thank you very much. Some very stimulating and uh, uh, good questions from, from the, uh, not questions, comments from, from the audience and suggestions. Uh, and I'm going to uh, turn it back now. Who wants to go first? How did we do this the last time? Did we, the, the, the presenter goes first and then? Yeah, yeah I'll, go first. I'm, I'm, I'll go first because I'm saying common sense. I don't know what he's doing. Uh, okay, well, let's begin with common sense. <laughs> Dear, oh dear, I do ask you not to give in to Peter's fruitless meanderings. <laughs> I mean, how so, you know, he tends to drink his own Kool-Aid, which is one of, the, one of the things that happens if people go to the London School of Economics. But, <laughs> I mean, how self-indulgent and complacent can you get? Um, now, I know it's uh, uncomfortable for an American audience to be told that the West, led by America, has lost its way and its influence in the world is diminished. But it's no good sticking one's head into the sand. And contrary to Peter, I am not a doomsayer. On the contrary, as I've said, I have called, and I will call in a few minutes, for action. And unfortunately, what happens here in America is that in the media and the public discussion, it's talking about floods, and it's talking about fires, and it's talking about critical race theory, and it's talking about Black Lives Matter, and it very rarely looks abroad at what's going on in the rest of the world. And what's going on in the rest of the world is changing very fast. Now, in my opening remarks, I painted the picture of how the world is changing, and fast changing. And I'm not suggesting that the United States and the West in general should put up the barricades crawl into a shell and adopt an isolationist policy. On the contrary, what we need is action. In the West, yes, values. We're proud of our values and the benefits that liberal democracy has brought us. But that doesn't mean to say that liberal democracy suits everyone else. China has achieved economic success and improvements for its people. You ask most of the Chinese to compare their living standards, the Han Chinese, their living standards with what they have now, with what they had 20 years ago, uh, the number of cars on the streets and the number of uh, things that they can do, uh, and, 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 and they, they, they can see that they've had a significant improvement in their life. So China has achieved economic success. Uh, India, Sri Lanka and Vietnam are not using China's system of pursuing forms of democracy that do not mirror the form that we have in the West. And of the 7.5 billion people in the world, it's estimated that there are over 1.8 billion 
uh, Muslims. That's almost a quarter of the global population. They don't always agree with each other, as we've seen, particularly the Sunni and the Shia, but they dislike, and many of them deeply resent Western influence in Islamic societies. So it would be a major step forward if in the West, if the West would keep its nose out of their political affairs as much as possible. And so I'm trying to set out here some of the things that the West should be thinking about when they look outside their domestic policies. In Europe, NATO has served Western security very well and should take active steps to remain strong. Russia is there geographically on NATO's eastern border and it's not going to go away, but Russia's economy is no more than that of Italy. It's really a fairly small economy and it's simply not in Russia's interest to invade Western Europe. E Europeans, therefore, uh, have to seek ways with due care to promote better economic and cultural relations with Russia. They can't avoid it, they have to do it. But at the same time, Europeans should always remember that he who sups with the devil should use a long spoon. <laughs> the population of Africa is at present like that of India, 1.3 billion. And the median age, would you believe, is 19.7 years old. By 2050, it is estimated that the population of Africa will double to 2.5 billion. Double in the next 30 years. And if Europe wants to stop the flood of Africans to Europe, it needs to invest heavily in Africa to create jobs and give help to the needy. That's what China's doing with the Belt and Road Initiative, whereas the United States and Europe are virtually nowhere in, 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 in Africa. Similarly, if the United States wants to halt the flow of immigrants from Central America, it needs to invest heavily in creating jobs and stability in Latin America. And as for the United States itself, which increasingly looks across the Pacific rather than across the Atlantic, if the 20th century was the American century, I put it to you that it seems increasingly likely that the 21st century will be the Chinese century, or at least the Asian century. China may yet fall on its nose, as Peter says, may yet fall on its nose by overreaching. That's what superpowers do. <clears throat> but it seems, but it is made clear that they have a policy that by 2049, that's the 100th anniversary of the establishment of the Chinese Communist Party, China intends to replace the United States as the world's superpower. That's what it intends to do. So America better wake up and pay attention. Relations between India and China will doubtless be prickly at times, but that's none of the West business. While regarding China as, at worst, a potential military opponent, a better policy would be cooperate with them where possible on issues such as climate change and the next pandemic and arms control, compete, compete with them commercially where practicable and actively counter them where necessary. Now, the United States has got a very significant advantage in both size and geography between the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. It's impossible to invade. But invasion is not the threat to the United States. The threats that we face as the humanity on, the, on this planet are climate change, the next pandemic, social inequality, and arms control. The United States should continue to provide Western leadership because there is no other Western country that is capable of doing it. But at present, the West has no strategy, no plan. I already referred to the meetings of the G7 and the NATO Council in June. And at those meetings, the governments recognised the problem. Now, I wonder how many of you in this audience have actually read those communiques. There's the G7 communique, the Brussels summit communique, I would guess that none of you have. Everyone, each one is over 70 paragraphs long, and it, perhaps it's only nerds like me who wade through the turgid declaratory prose of government <laughs> communicates. But they're both on the internet, I encourage you to have a look at them, and they're well worth reading. And the G7 came up with an agreed agenda. Here's an extract, quote, Our agenda for global action is built on our commitment to international cooperation, multilateralism, an open, resilient, rules-based world order. As democratic societies, we support global institutions in their efforts to protect human rights 
respect the rule of law, advance gender equality, manage tensions between states, address conflict, instability and climate change, and share prosperity through trade and investment. That open and resilient international order is in turn the best guarantor of security and prosperity for our own citizens." Unquote. Now this statement is a significant step forward, but an agenda is not an implementable plan. Putting flesh on the bones of an agenda requires the development of specific actions by government and by the business community, and it requires public support for them. CEOs of major US corporations, as well as thinking of shareholders and the company's stock price, need to think broadly and ask themselves, what is good for America? What is good for the West? Not just what is good for my company. Domestically, it means finding ways to release talents and funds to be spent on projects at home that need attention, such as income inequality, infrastructure, preparation for the next pandemic, climate change, and retraining workers to move from the industrial age to the digital age and the age of artificial intelligence. And along the way, if America did that, and the West did that, they would retain and hopefully improve creativity, innovation, and economic vibrancy. Abroad, it means working together, not nationalism, self-isolation. It means finding ways to move ahead despite differing agendas and priorities. To the United States, addressing the rise of China is a major priority. Europeans, however, feel that China is a long way away, and it's also a big market for trade. But Europeans, again, have to recognize that they risk falling into a Chinese trap. And then there's another question. Before President Biden went to Europe for the G7 meeting, he said that in his conversations with world leaders, he'd made it known that America is back. But the comment that he heard from most of them was, quote, we see America is back, but for how long? For how long? So I return to a quote from <clears throat> the Munich Security Conference. And I keep quoting the Munich Security Conference because it is where governments gather together uh, and discuss political security issues. Quote, for some critics, the incompetent response of Western governments during the pandemic are further a proof of their relative decline. For others, the pandemic is at least a wake-up call. Now, I'm not suggesting that the West should withdraw into an isolationist shell. The, no. the West should maintain its existing commitments to other countries, and then necessary in extremists that might well involve military action. But feckless, dithering Europe an inconsistently politically dysfunctional America need to relearn how to work together. Government and business need to learn how to work together. We must hang together or we shall be hanged separately. What is needed is a clear-eyed, hard-headed reassessment of strategy, an action plan, and then public support for it to happen. But if that doesn't happen, the West will continue to lose its way and it'll be left behind, and I suggest to you that that would be unforgivable. So in sum, by recognising that the West has at present lost, as I've already said, it's not an acceptance of defeat. On the contrary, it's a clarion call for action. And so I ask you to vote in favour of the motion. Thank you. more with all of that. <laughs> you argued that the West has not lost its way, it just needs a kick up the backside. <laughs> and it hasn't lost it. The motion is that the West has, past tense, lost it. It isn't that it's about to go to sleep or that it is asleep, it's going to wake up. The motion is that the West has lost it. Either it has or it hasn't. Either it's in a struggle or it's given up and it's defeated already. And I'm arguing that it's not defeated already. I didn't hear any of you really say that it's defeated already. We are saying that there are difficulties. You said, I believe, that there are problems with democracy. There have been problems with democracy since it was invented. Not least in the United States. But they've been resolved 
Why do you think they're not going to be resolved now? There were comments about the, uh, the cl climate change. Does anyone seriously think the Chinese, in their race to prosperity, are going to war prioritize climate change? They're not. They're building, somebody said, they're building coal, coal stations like crazy. It's the easiest thing they, they can do to build, their, to build out their economy. This, and Derek keeps coming back, so he, he wants to lecture us about what he thinks the West needs to do. Okay, Derek, I get it. We need to do stuff. But it doesn't mean we've lost it. It means we need to do better. It's like a student at school. We gave you a C plus. Could you please try harder? Good. But that doesn't mean the West has lost it. The motion is the West has lost it. It's, it you don't have a choice here. Either it's lost it and it's over, or the struggle goes on. And we're getting back into the game. We're doing stuff that you suggest. The Munich that you keep... The mu I don't have it. I simply have a yellow piece of paper. I can't read it. It's terrible. It's so boring. Underlying values, people. This is about a cultural clash. Underlying values. Tolerance. Freedom. Individuality. Freedom of religion. Freedom of expression. They are Western values and people want them. Migrants are coming to the West. They may have been coming to the West for some of the wrong reasons, but they're coming to the West. They have the choice. They can go on a boat and go to the China. They can go to Malaysia. They can go to Thailand. They can go to Cambodia. They don't. They don't. They come to the West. And they're not stupid. They're voting with their lives to come to the West. And it's time for us all to wake up to the realization that economic charts, scorecards, aren't what this is about. This is about a clash of values, and they are Western values defining the world debate. <clears throat> Why do the Chinese say things like they look at the United States as the ideological barrier to their success? Ideological barrier to their success, not economic barrier to their success. Why do we think that trade, by the way, is always a bad thing? It's a Western creation that free trade benefits everybody. It benefits everybody. The United States ran a, a, death, a trade deficit in 2019 of $345.2 billion with China. That sounds absolutely terrible. Could be better. But it also means that American consumers bought a whole bunch of stuff cheaper than they would otherwise and therefore could afford other stuff. That trade was good. It provided cheap goods for American consumers that they would not have had otherwise. You can't, free trade is a, is a European, Western, Western value. <clears throat> Don't give up on it. The biggest, uh, by the way, China is the third largest trade partner of the United States, after Mexico and Canada. We're not worried about Mexico and Canada, I suppose, in quite the same ways we are worried about China. Because it's values. Michael, you mentioned oh, it's a clash between autocracy and democracy, and then you proclaimed its own. We ran this, somebody mentioned, we ran this tape in the 1930s. Guess which side won? We ran this tape against the Soviet Union. Guess which side won? Western values will prevail. And it's messy. It's always been messy. In fact, the strength of the, United, of the Western world is that it is messy because it's a conversation. Values can populate up. They can be changed. Autocracies can't change. They have one way of doing it. If the world, the environment changes, they have to adapt and they fail to adapt. The Soviets fail to adapt. The Chinese will fail to adapt. The Chinese look at the messiness of democracy as a structural weakness, where in fact, it is the very strength on which the West will prevail. I urge you to reject this motion. And don't forget those migrants. Thank you. <laughs> okay, as always, the moment of truth has arrived. Um, I tried to... Um, boil this down to a, a question that you have to answer. Is the West likely to respond effectively to the Chinese challenge? 
If you think the answer to that question is yes, you will vote for Peter. If you think that the answer to that question is no, you will vote for Derek. Is that fair? Well, it's not the motion. Not the motion. It's not the motion. Word. We should vote. You, you've done a very good job semantically, <laughs> and I won't dispute that. Vote on the motion. Yes. We'll vote on the motion. We will vote on the motion. Okay. Gloria and Liz, would you both assist in the counting? Um, Gloria, will you 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 uh, take this side of the house, and Liz, you take that side of the house. Those in favor of the motion, please raise your hand. Please restate the motion. The, the motion, the West has lost it. Lost it or lost its way? The West has lost it. That's the motion. He added the word way to fool you. <laughs> All in favor of the West has lost it. Tell me when you've got it. I got it. Okay. All those who oppose the motion. I think we have a winner. I think it's the abstentions, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> Abstentions are not permitted. <laughs> Abstentions are not permitted. Do you, have you got it? You have to confer now. This is very tense. <laughs> okay, may I have the envelope, please? <laughs> They won. Okay. In other words, the motion is defeated. Yes. And Peter has won. Now I can announce the score is two to two. Four years, four debates. Penalty kicks. Two two. <laughs> Penalty kicks.